name is Dustin Nance. I'm the Vice President of the AITP Capital Chapter. That's the Association of Information Technology Professionals uh, here in Springfield, where we're based. Um, AITP has been around for like 50 years. Um, we've uh, got a, a chapter here in Springfield, there's a chapter in St. Louis, a chapter in Bloomington, Chicago, that's the ones here in Illinois. Um, uh, we have a conference every spring and every fall. Um, usually they're somewhere like St. Louis or sometimes Chicago. Um, but anyway, um, I'm guessing most of you guys are familiar with SVNUG. You members of SVNUG? That's the Sangamon Valley .NET Users Group. Um, Alan Scharfenberg um, is the president of, of that organization. And we got together and decided we needed to do something um, together between our organizations. And um, Terry had gotten great reviews from the SVNUG group. Uh, they really liked this presentation. And, and our members are interested in that kind of thing too. Um, so we decided to have Terry come. Um, thank you, Terry. First, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I started into electronics in high school um, and right after high school I went into the Air Force as a ground radio technician so for the six years I was in the Air Force the first year year and a half I was in electronic school learning all about radios and electronic components and fixing radios and since I was in the guard for the Air Force I worked and I worked on copiers which is more mechanical than electronics and from there I went into networking and then I became a programmer what I really got tired of fixing other people's stuff and wanted to make my own bugs so from there I have been programming for about 15 years and recently um, a company I work for needed to solve a problem and the problem I, I felt would be solved with a, an electronic device and since I messed around with it as a hobby um, I came up with this device which I'll show you later um, for them and it's it saved them quite a bit of money to solve solve a logistics problem so why is embedded electronics important well I talked about that device, and I want to tell a little story. This morning, I was sitting uh, in my boss's office, and we have another electronics, I think, a problem we could solve with electronics. We have a very large corporation that's a customer of ours. Um, and they supply us with their computer systems. So all the data is theirs throughout our entire facility. But we have to invoice on data they give us. Hmm, how do we check that they're giving us the correct information to invoice them and not what they say we did? Well, actually, I forgot to grab this. Everything is done through one of these, a barcode scanner. So we get these barcodes and we scan it. It tells us what we're supposed to do with it and where it goes next. It's USB. All it does is feed keyboard codes through USB into their software, onto their network. How many people have heard of a keylogger? Well, I got to thinking about this problem this morning because I've been working on our invoicing system. And there's this little chip here. It's a um, USB chip, but it can also act as a USB device. So with two of these chips, I can take that USB, plug it in, and then plug the other side out, grab the data, the barcodes we're scanning, and feed it into our system so we can now get that data in line with it and without affecting what's going into their system, without having to screen scrape or any, anything like that. Don't know if the project's going to happen, but just kind of a... I thought of how, how just a simple chip can 
change ways of doing things. So I thought I'd start with a little bit of basic electronics. How many know the difference between AC and DC? Okay. Well, for those of you who don't, AC is alternating current. Um, it's what comes out of the wall. Um, it's very high voltage and it has its uses. DC is what most everything digital runs on. There are some a analog components, which I'll get into in a little bit. But there are some basic components that we have to work with. Everybody knows what a light switch is, but they know what a resistor is, and what it does. Okay, Resistor s impedes the flow of electrons, so it, it resists it. We have inductors, which are basically coils or transformers, and they, they can affect the, the signal or they can be used to produce a magnetic, um, such as the coils in a motor, can be used to provide motion through electromotive force. Um, then there's capacitors, and it's all kinds of capacitors. These store electrons and they're often used for filtering electronic signals. I don't have a diode, but typically they look a lot like a resistor, just don't have the lines on them, and they only allow electrons to flow one way. Then we have transistors. Here's a few of those. Um, transistors are an electronic switch. And then we have ICs, which they come in all types sizes and shapes from like this to this here to tiny little surface mount ones like I showed you here. And they all serve different purposes. So let's move on a little bit. So when I talked about AC versus DC, that's analog versus digital. Um, and basically, that's the difference in the signals. Can someone tell me an example of an, something we, that would be considered analog in electronics? Go ahead. Radio receiver. That's, that's non, a good one. Non HD. Yeah. Just a plain old well, receiver. the output of it is analog. Uh, the speakers, when you listen to radio or even this, it outputs an analog signal. Um, it's something that's going to have a sine wave to it, or very similar to a sine wave. Um, what we can control in an analog signal is frequency, so how, how short the distance between the two peaks are, um, the amplitude of it, um, how much noise is on the line, and the shape of that wave. Whereas in digital, which I'm sure everybody can name digital devices from a phone to a computer to, well, just about everything today is digital. But we can control the frequency, how quickly it's, it's changing state. We can also control its noise. But most importantly, we control its state. It's either anything above a particular amplitude is considered high, one, and that's how a transistor works. When you have your base pin set to a high, that'll, that's telling it, or set to a certain level, it tells it, go ahead and switch and allow current to pass through. The simplest of the switches, digital. So now let's get into the fun stuff, microcontroller. Basically, a microcontroller is, is a processor, but it's designed for a specific set of features, and there are thousands of them out on the market. Um, several different manufacturers, um, even, even the Intel processors are technically microcontrollers. They're just designed for a specific purpose. So they, they have specific types of input-output pins, 
um, varying for their purpose. So let, let's talk about some of those pens and what, what kind of communication they do. The very basic is a general input-output port. It, it can either receive or put out a high and low signal. So if you want to see whether something is a 1 or a 0, that's, that's the type of port you would use. Now parallel is taking a bunch of those, usually 8, 16, 32, sometimes 24-bit, um, which would be the number of pins, um, to receive data in at once. Serial is two pins. Well, three technically because you have to have a common ground. But two pins, a transmit and a receive. SPI. SPI is just like serial. So you have a transmit pin and a receive pin. It's the same pin. You have a clock pin, and then you have what's called a CS pin. And what this CS pin is, chip select. So you can have, unlike serial, which is two devices that can talk to each other, and only those two devices can talk, you could have, here, let's take a stack of devices here. With SPI, I could have this board, this board, this board, and this board, all talking on the same lines, the same two, two lines, the clock and the transmit receive pin. They each would have a CS pin from the master, whatever one is considered the, the master controller, the rest are slaves. When that pin goes high on one of those de devices, that's the one it's talking to and the one that's transmitting and receiving. Then there's I2C. Let me grab this real quick. I2C is a two-pin interface, but it can also connect to uh, tons of other devices, 256 to be exact. There are 256 addresses, so instead of using a pin that goes high and low, this address is called first, that's sent it, transmitted out, and then a register, um, an address on the chip itself is requested and then it feeds back, transmits back, so it knows which one is connecting. And the reason it's, I think it's 8-bit, yeah, it's 8-bit, so they're an 8-bit address and an 8-bit register address. So. Then we have fun devices, uh, pins called analog to digital. And what they'll do is they'll take an analog voltage and convert it to a digital value. Um, and vice versa with the digital to analog. You output a analog voltage based on a digital value you set in code for that pen. So let's talk about development boards. Since most of us aren't going to be able to take one of these little tiny chips and solder it onto a board and hook it up just to see if a circuit's going to work, we use what are called development boards. Um, I'll show you a varying set of different off-the-counter, off-the-shelf um, development boards. Um, there are others that you can just hook up plug in. Um, but a development board is a board that exposes the pens in a way that we can hook it up and build test circuits before we would mass produce or whatever we would need to design um, around that board for our specific application. Um, there are ways we can do it where we can get what are called prototyping boards and maybe this is your project. You're done, you solder it up and these pins simply plug in to the development board if you don't bend them. Plug into the development board and it just works. Um, I'll get into that project in a little bit. Um, unlike a 
standard computer. Um, most of them do not have a display. They simply expose I.O. pens, um, and they usually provide some form of communication to program that board. So let's, let's talk about um, the Netduino. Netduino is a .NET platform. And here's an example of the regular Netduino. You can write .NET C Sharp code or even VB code right onto this and control the pens, um, read in voltages. And the one I just sh showed you even has a network port on it. So you can actually connect over the network. Um, there are projects where people are sending out tweets over it. I have developed this project, which I'll go into a little bit, that talks to a REST web service so that I can read data off of this and feed it into a system. Um, there's also the Netduino Go. I don't have one of those. But all of the sensors, like cameras and other devices, they just plug into it and there's a library already pre-written to work with it. Um, in fact, a lot of it's drag and drop coding. And there's also the, the Gadgeteer, .NET Gadgeteer, which is also C-sharp um, based. It has a, a graphical designer where you can just draw lines between it to uh, wire up uh, uh, your logic. The Arduino comes in a wide variety. Oh, before I, before I move on to the Netduino, the Netduino also has this chip here. Um, it's called the Netduino Mini. It has uh, a very basic set of pens, but it also works with, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, the old basic stamps. Um, you could write like quick basic style applications right onto a chip. This works the same way, but it's C-sharp. And this is just a development board I had designed to program it. But uh, yeah, it's a one format of it. So let's move on to the Arduino. As you can tell, there's tons of different Arduino styles. They have a mini as well, although it's not basic stamp compatible. It's just a small version of it. It even has a reset switch on it. And it has all of those different types of um, communication protocols built into it, except for the digital to analog out. None of these have uh, digital to analog out. However, with SPI and I2C, you can talk to chips that will be able to do that. Uh, here's the Arduino Uno. All of these are programmed over USB serial. And then the Mega. Basically, the big difference between all of these, and I don't know if you noticed, these pinouts on these boards are all the same between the Netduino, the uh, Arduino, and I'll show you the Maple here in a minute. They all have the same pinouts, and that's all because of this uh, group out of uh, Italy that came out with this. Then people started building shields and stuff for it, and then all these other companies started making their boards pen compatible with these. These are written in the Arduino, is written in C. They use two different types of processors or microcontrollers in theirs. Um, all of the ones I have are AVR based. It's really just the, uh, the machine language that runs underneath um, and the type of processor. They're all Atmel brand processors. These um, are all 8-bit. The Netduino is actually, while it can run C-sharp code, it can also run C, and it's an ARM processor. Um, you have about 512K of RAM on those. You have 64K of RAM on these. The this one just uses a larger version of it, gives you more outputs. Um, this is actually typically used if you need a lot more serial connections or a lot more what's called PWM, which I didn't go into. Well, I'll go into when I talk about this project. Um, it's a type of 
modulation of a of a digital signal to produce an output but this has a lot more of those that's needed for like quadcopters or motor control um, one thing I didn't show you there is another company that also makes them it's GHI and they have what are called their Fez Pandas boards but it's also an ARM chip and it runs C sharp code and then there's the fly maple so I talked about the Arduino which used an AVR chip it's an 8-bit chip I have I don't have a maple but I have a fly maple and the fly maple is a arm chip very powerful arm chip that um, I can write C code basic C basically C code I'll go into that a little bit in a minute but C code that runs on this and it's a very powerful arm chip so it's it's like the Arduino but much more powerful faster and more memory to work with so a little show and tell so I talked about this project here a minute ago this uses a Netduino and I have that rest service I talked to what this is is we had a problem at work we have this really great new server room all this very very you know millions and dollars of equipment and we needed to make sure that it was cooled properly and but we needed a sensor to tell us if it got hot so rather than go out and spend thousands of dollars I was like hey I can spend a weekend and build something real quick with a three dollar temperature sensor and I already have this networking board here and I can put a display that'll show us in the server room what the temperature of our server room is so three dollar chip this here is a um, this what's called a shift register so it takes parallel data no shift register opposite it takes serial data in over SPI and outputs it into parallel so I send serial signals to this which tells each pin on this display which one to light up so that's how I'm controlling this display and the rest service I wrote uses Google's um, voice system to send us all text messages if it goes above a threshold and then I also have a telnet server on it so we can telnet into it and set up the phone numbers and who gets connect who uh, who gets texts and what the bottom threshold is if it gets too cold which probably will never happen or if it gets too hot we all get alerts on our cell phones all because of this little three dollar temperature sensor and when we looked on the market it was cheaper to have me build this I think it's sixty dollars um, for this or thousands of dollars for the professional monitoring systems it also has an SD card in it that it stores historical charting data that uh, we can output it to Excel um, and it's all written in C sharp um, let's see the next thing I wanted to show well before I go on I'm going to show a couple other components you can get um, th these are um, touchscreen displays that you can get uh, for hobbyists and it's all controlled over a serial connection so you could actually use it on a computer and control it or even from one of these development boards which these are about 30 bucks one of these and there are libraries right out on Arduino's website and you just copy that little code in and then you make calls to it and control these um, and they also have SD support on it so if you need to load graphics or images you can put that in, built into the uh, SD card that same company also makes a VGA out so if you need a larger display how in it oh, same commands same um, command set that the smaller displays have um, I do think you're limited though to um, 640 by 480 resolution on these uh, VGA outs 
So probably not going to make uh, you know your high definition video, but you can uh, display information or even uh, make pong, build your own uh, computer-based uh, game player. So let's talk about another type of technology. How many people have heard of RFID? Cool. Well, there are chips out there, such as this one, or little boards, that are designed to work over serial or I2C to allow us to pick up over an antenna board like this RFID tags. They're, they come in all sorts of sh everything from a card to stickers like this one um, that have their their antenna printed on them to you can actually buy printers that print out RFID tags. So this goes into this project I did for where I work. We're a logistics company and we move product through our plant, um, packaging it, bringing things together, kitting them, and we needed to be able to know where everything was at and tag everything. Now you can buy off-the-shelf RFID scanners. Problem is, is when we were researching it, every time we would research an RFID scanner, maybe it supported Windows Mobile and we could write some C-sharp code for it for our business. It, by the time we were about ready to purchase, it was discontinued and there was a new model. Well, now we're going to have to rewrite our code to work with this new, new model, and it was inconsistent. So we wanted something that was going to be our own and something that we could sell, reuse, and develop whatever we wanted it to do. So everything from the case design, which it actually has a rubber coating around this, and uh, it's uh, environmentally sealed and everything, I designed, oh, I screwed it in. This board here, designed the board, this uh, display, even this uh, touch pad, and it's using an ARM chip, and I'm actually running Linux on this box, on this chip here, with uh, Mono running C-sharp code, and we have wireless um, Wi-Fi underneath here. Let me pull this out. Without breaking the pins, there we go. And it's also socket replaceable for our processor cards. But we also have USB Wi-Fi USB out, and uh, it all runs on a little uh, battery, much like the one for this helicopter, a little LiPo battery. And it will last 8 to 16 hours on one of our batteries. And it's got the RFID scanner built into it. This is one of my prototype ones. So this, this was developed using basic electronics and uh, the same concepts in fact, this touchpad design came from, let me find it here, if I can find it here. Hmm. Well, it is using basically one of these minis, the chip that's on it, and a capacitive touch sensor, actually six of them which make up um, all these connections. And when you touch it, it changes the capacitance and sends me a keyboard signal to the, the chip. So, and then every, th every one of our um, products that goes through is tagged with an RFID tag. And then we can scan it and see exactly where everything is. Um, it also has a buzzer in it. Um, one of the things that they were afraid of is that one of the employees would drop it in one of the bins and then it would go out and we wouldn't hear it. So before it goes out, they all, it's going to send a signal and this will buzz. So if it's inside a crate before it goes on a truck, um, hopefully they hear it and 
or if we lose one, we can find it. So last project, I guess, well, I'll show another component. Um, there are cameras you can get. These work over serial as well. They're only like 320 by 240. Um, you can get these and just over serial, be able to read the data, store it to an SD card, whatever, um, just with some serial, serial signals. And one other thing. Sure you've seen them, and this is actually something we're thinking about putting in our next version of this. It is a thermal printer, and it works over serial. I just send serial commands to it, and it will print, print out our tags that would go on with our RFID. Um, unfortunately, my case was too small. Um, it's thicker than the uh, case, so it didn't work out in this version. So let's talk about something fun, robotics. So the fly maple, I talked about it a little bit earlier. It uses that arm chip. What's really neat about the fly maple, oh, I'll bring this out so you guys can see it. If you're interested, there's a company called SparkFun. They make what are called breakout boards. They take a chip, put it on a board, give you pins that you can plug into a breadboard to hook it up. So. Uh, on that, on the on each of these break these breakout boards, I have a. I think this one is a gyro. Yes, this is a gyro. Um, I don't know if you guys know what a gyro does, but it detects motion. Uh, it's a three-axis gyro. So with with it, if a vehicle is spinning this way. My z-axis is going to give me an increasing or decreasing value. Um, if I'm tilting this way, um, my y-axis will, and then my x-axis if I'm tilting this way. An accelerometer, which is what this one is, tells me where gravity is. This is a three-axis accelerometer, so it tells me where gravity is. No matter what the angle is, I get three values of where gravity is at. Um, so that is also available. They make them in a breakout board. And then um, one chip I don't have in a, uh, a breakout is a magnometer. I have a triple axis magnometer that's also built into this. All these chips are built into the, uh, this development board. A magnometer tells me where the strongest magnetic field is. So if I want to know where north is, I'd use a magnometer, and it should tell me, no matter how my angle is with a three-axis magnometer that's tilt compensated, which way north is. However, there is a problem. And I, ha I haven't proven this out yet, that I have got my motors far enough back, but these are big magnets. So uh, if I don't have these uh, far enough out, um, it's going to mess up my, my north reading. So I, I'm going to have to look into that. And then it has what's called a bar barometric pressure sensor, which is basically um, how an altimeter works. So I can know how what my altitude is. Based on the barometric pressure above sea level, it, it changes dramatically, actually. And that's how I'll be able to tell how high up this is. All of this is written with C code. And I'm also going to hook up, eventually, they're called. XBs. What these are is um, fairly long range. I can get up to two miles. Um, serial wireless transmission. So I can either send out a beacon to another one of these telling my location using the GPS that will go into it that's also serial. And or 
um, to a hand controller that I send it serial, con uh, serial commands. Or I could even have ground stations that tell me restricted areas to stay out of so I can provide autonomous flight for this. So, and then I can also, since it's serial, hook it up over USB and get telemetry data right onto the computer. And then, uh, basically, now I talked about PWM. This, these here are called electronic speed controllers. They take a PWM signal and then control the speed at which these motors spin. Pulse width modulation, yes. So basically we just increase or decrease the, the distance between the pulses and it tells how fast these motors should run so that we can create stable flight so that it can balance. Um, if I want to make it yaw or turn like this, I could make these two, which are going in opposite directions, slow down so it would spin. Because um, basically, how a quadcopter works, is you have four motors, but they're not, um, if a helicopter took off and it didn't have that vertical um, prop, it would just spin out of control. Same thing would happen here if I had all these motors spinning in the same direction. It would just spin. So two of them are going the opposite direction. And by controlling their speeds, we can create stable flight. And that's with the accelerometer and the gyro. Using a quadratic equation to combine all that data, we can get what level is to uh, create stable flight. So, any questions? Yes? Uh, what would be a good introductory Adreno uh, training kit? You know, just assuming that one knows a little bit about electronics and knows about programming but hasn't put the two together. Radio Shack actually has some new. Um, oh, I'm sorry, what was the name? Radio Shack. Uh, oh, Radio, Radio Shack, Shack yeah, okay. has some, um, at least the one in Beacon, has these new Arduino Uno starter kits that come with an Arduino. Um, I don't have them here. They have a bunch of these uh, connecting wires and a bunch of various sensors, and, and, uh, and some of the sensors I even talked about. Um, varying resistors and capacitors. Um, what else does it come? It comes with a couple breadboards, all in a in a carrying case, and it has separated out sections. I just saw that the other day uh, when I went to Radio Shack. So that I would probably say is the best introductory kit. That I didn't look at the price. I think is about a hundred bucks for the kit. That's a, that's a good place to start, too. I have a couple of different questions. Um, first one is you got out of the military, uh, you were doing radios. I'm guessing you got a degree. Was it in engineering or, com or programming? I did not get a degree. Oh, I am self-taught. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, I say self-taught. I learned a lot in the military, and I've yeah. learned a lot through my business experience. I mean, I've been programming since I was actually like 13, so. Yeah. Okay. And uh, second question is the uh, the actual barometer. How accurate is that thing? Because I read about I've been looking into building one of those myself. But the barometer, how like if you throw it up in the air like five feet, is it going to notice that difference, or is it more of a like, five feet? It may not be as noticeable. Um, that same barometer I have seen people use in model rockets mm -hmm. um, to detect when apogee occurs. Okay. And it also detects, um, you can use the barometer also to detect when you hit the speed of sound. Mm -hmm. um, some model rockets can get that fast um, because your pressure completely um, 
it's like a big implosion on the inside of it. Yeah, but it wouldn't be able to control like the uh, like the dif distance between the floor and the ceiling in this room per se. Oh, it it, w it would definitely be noticeable. Would it be controllable though? Would it be something where you could look at it and determine, hey, if I go above this point, I'm gonna crash into the, the lights? Oh uh, no, no, okay. you're not you're not gonna be able, especially inside of a building. Yeah, your your barometric pressure is gonna be different. Even with the doors or your furnace or air conditioning running, is going to affect that barometric pressure. Okay. I've had it sitting on my desk and the furnace changes on, and it just completely throws off all my readings. All right. Cool. Yes. How long did the the project that you did with the the scanner that you talked about? How long of a project was that from when you decided to build your own until you had it like in production at least the first? first um, I actually had to put that project um, on hold. I have not put it into production yet. Um, however, I stopped on it uh, last August. Was it August? Yeah, last August I spent two months um, and actually had several rounds of um, PC boards come from uh, China several times, having them manufactured due to, well, testing and flaws found. And uh, it's actually just about ready. It's actually the software code that's the problem. So, other than being pulled off onto other projects, it was about a three, three to four month project. However, most of it at that time was waiting for the boards to be manufactured and sent to me. Yeah. On, on that Go same ahead. project, uh, yes. what was your rationale behind using mono on an embedded system? I know C sharp better than I know C. Okay. <laughs> That's what I thought. On the XBs, you said you had a range of about two miles. Dep Where depends on the XBs. Mm -hmm. The XB Pros, mm -hmm. can you can get about two miles. Is uh, that like the store line of sight? Okay. Line so of sight. Trees, buildings, and such. Yeah, that will that will affect it. Mm -hmm. Indoor, it's it's like two three hundred feet. The mm -hmm. nine hundred megahertz one though, I believe is ten kilometers. The nine hundred megahertz versions mm -hmm. versus the two point four. But you're limited to 9,600 baud. Anybody else? I'm not yeah. as familiar with these as some of these other guys probably are, but how do you, when you program them, do you just hook a USB cable from a computer to the board? Is that how you um, For the Netduinos, the same cable I'm using to charge my phone right now, okay. plugs into it. It's a micro V. Okay. Um, the Arduinos are typically um, B, um, same kind you would have on a printer. Okay. Um, my board, I used a, no. This is a micro B. These are, I don't know what these are. It's something B. Crap, I forgot the name of what this one is. Um, or that. It's all USB. Um, the <coughs> Maple uses the same, that same cable. However, um, it's using a different brand. Look again what the brand is. I think it's ST. Yeah. ST Microelectronics is the manufacturer of that one. They have a special protocol built into their chips. Um, so it works both serial and their proprietary protocol that installs a driver. Um, the company that makes this, it's uh, the DF Robot company, but there's also um, Leaf Labs, who makes the regular maple. Those are, um, it, it all comes with their, um, their IDE, the drivers for it. Okay. Um, the IDE, you, I don't, I don't know if you guys may be familiar with processing at all. Um, there's an IDE called processing, which is for on-screen stuff, but it uses the same IDE. It just uses a uh, GCC compiler uh, built specific for the chips. And yes. It compiles into a source code and then puts yep. it on the it, it knows how to tell GCC. It has some built-in libraries that work with it. And uh, like each one of these boards has a specific bootloader for them. If you wanted to go to ST Microelectronics and get their compiler and pay for it, you could certainly do that um, and write in C or whatever their IDE is. 
Um, but all of these are um, based on open source um, IDEs, either the Arduino IDE or the uh, Mabel IDE. Uh, you had a camera there. Uh, I believe you said it was controlled over serial. Have you played with that at all? Yes, I have. Uh, however, um, it didn't work out real well. One thing I will point out with the Arduino uh -huh. is it gives you that high-level C-sharp code. However, there's a few caveats to that. It's managed code. So anything that's time-sensitive cannot be real-time on this, and you cannot rely on how quickly um, it's going to do a garbage collection on the memory. So randomly, you could have a two to three millisecond, which doesn't seem like a lot on a PC, <laughs> Put on a little processor like that, that is a long time. And while this worked, I was actually trying to transmit it over an XP live video from one of these. And it did not work out real well because the speed of even a three, 300, it's raw RGB. Okay. There is no compression on this. There's no way of encoding it? Um, if you wanted to write some algorithms on your. Uh, Microcontroller, you probably could. Okay, and the other thing is, last question, I swear, um, there's a uh, Raspberry Pi. Okay, the Raspberry Pi is probably actually closer to uh, this, but even a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, it is a full ARM processor, unlike these, which are um, earlier versions of the ARM, so they have a lot more memory, they can run um, Linux with higher end graphics. Um, it is definitely a good chip and there are, um, it does not have this layout, but they do um, have a lot of people are now coming out with um, shields and um, pre-built things that you can plug in. In fact, Radio Shack has the same kit for a Raspberry Pi. Um, I just saw online the other day. It all depends. I could have went with the Raspberry Pi. Did you on try your real time connections, the ones that are near real time? Did you try them on an FPGA? Um, board on there and run those off of an FPGA? I, I could have done that. I can also write native C code for this, so I could have done some real time. I've never programmed FPGAs. Um, the big difference between this, of course, and an FPGA is the power requirements for an FPGA are going to be much greater. Uh, the, the little Xilinx are small enough now that you can run them up as daughters off of that. And there, anything you'd want near real time. Uh, there is a shield someone wrote for the uh, Netduino using one of those Xilinx FPGAs. It's called the, uh, oh, what did he call it? Man, I can't remember. The Spartan 3. Yeah, yeah, the Spartan 3. He, he built a shield for it so you could write your FPGA code for real time stuff or whatever, and it had tons of IOs on it. Um, man, I cannot think of the name of that shield, but uh, it had some crazy, crazy name. But yes. And one last thing if everybody's done. Let's go through there. box. I want to first thank you for coming back to Springfield with the presentation. Uh, as a token of our appreciation, this is for you. I want to thank you. Um, Singham Valley .NET Users Group and the AITP Capital Chapter here in Springfield, we hold monthly meetings. The, the sign-in sheet that we sent around um, if you gave us legitimate email addresses, we'll just send you an email thanking <laughs> you for attending <laughs> and, and give you information on websites and um, organizations. So expect just one piece of spam from us after tonight. But thank you all for showing up. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you.